Welcome to Good News, being brought to you by Listening for Clues. We are Lauren Welch and John Shimatek, deacons in the Episcopal Diocese of Maryland. We sure are. And today we've got a really special guest, a longtime friend and deacon colleague, the Reverend Ann Reed. Anne is currently living in Cincinnati and serving as deacon, not in just one, but in two congregations, which I sure want to hear about. Anne's also the chaplain associate for the Siemens Church Institute. She's a Habitat volunteer. She sings, I'm assuming Sweet Adeline is a barbershop type of uh, group, sings with Sweet Adeline, and you are a foot care volunteer, which also seems like kind of a unique thing. So, Anne, welcome. We're so glad to have you here today. Thank you, John and Lauren. It's wonderful to be with you. We are delighted to be with you, Anne. So, tell us about your diaconal ministries. You are involved in so many in this <laughs> retirement of yours. <laughs> right. Well, I, as I was approaching retirement, I wondered how I wanted to spend my time. And I was trained at Shalem as a spiritual director a few years ago. I did that prior to, I guess I did that about eight years ago. And so I started offering spiritual direction while I was still working full time at the Diocese of Southern Ohio. And then I also, when I became the director of the Transfiguration Spirituality Center for five years, that sort of meshed really well with my spiritual direction. So that was my paid employment position. And the pandemic hit and retreat centers went offline a good bit. And my husband Giff and I decided that we would retire in 2020. So from our paying jobs, if you will. We haven't retired from life. We've just retired from collecting a regular paycheck. So the things that I was involved in before I retired from full-time work have continued, but they've taken on more life. So the Siemens Church Institute chaplaincy really has become more robust in my retirement days. And serving as a deacon in two congregations is a blessing. And one is a historically black congregation in Cincinnati. It's about an hour, a mile from where I live. And the other is a suburban congregation where the priest and I were friends from previous days. And so when he came to the diocese, we got reconnected and he asked me to come serve as deacon there. So that's how I ended up in two churches. Yeah, and so, and so Anne, that is kind of a, that's a very interesting story about the two churches. Are they, aside from you, you're the link between them, I guess, but is there, any kind of, is there a relationship as well between these different populations and congregations or not really? Not very much. The part of town where the larger primarily white congregation is located is in pretty much a northern suburb of Cincinnati. It has affiliations with three other Episcopal churches. The other historically Black church in the Cincinnati area is St. Simon of Cyrene, and that's close to where Christ Church Glendale is, which is the larger church. St. Andrew's Evanston, which is the African-American church I serve, is more in relationship with churches that are in the city proper rather than in the suburbs. However, um, I am the link. And so there's a ministry at Christchurch Glendale, in which women are making mats for people who are living out on the street. They're mats made out of knit together, or crocheted together out of plastic bags. And so these mats, they're basically bedrolls. And, and St. Andrews has a pantry where they meet the needs of those who are living without a roof over their heads or those who are struggling financially to feed their families. And so they got the first bedroll that's that Christ Church made was given to their pantry so that they could pass it on to so they're knit together that way. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. Literally. <laughs> yeah. I've always wondered about deacons that are serving in more than one parish and I'm I'm uh -huh. Thinking here in this diocese, we're starting to see a little bit more of that because we're few in number and always have been few. Right. In, and I think it's just like so much of the way the church is changing 
So uh, you find it challenging to divide your time between the two congregations, or have you settled into a routine of some sort? I think over the years, it's become a routine. I've been doing it now for about five years or more. And St. Andrews was the first church. I served St. Andrews first. And, and that was when I was working full time. I felt the need to have a connection. It was very challenging because I was on Bishop's staff. It was very challenging to find a congregation that would accept my ministry as diaconal ministry rather than as bishop staff ministry. And so St. Andrews was willing and able to receive my ministry as well as for me to work with them in many ways. As at the time, it felt proper for me to be there about once a month. It has evolved into essentially two Sundays at Christ Church Glendale, one Sunday at St. Andrews, and I rotate through those. And leadership has changed at St. Andrews, so there's a tighter connection now than there was before. I don't find it difficult or challenging because in the Diocese of Southern Ohio, Bishop Reidenthal, who was the bishop under whom I served when I first came, encouraged deacons to not just make the church their ministry, but to also have a connection in the world. So that was when the Habitat ministry started. And so I helped coordinate with a colleague and friend, this coalition of churches, it's called the Hope Coalition. And when it was founded, they were both Episcopal and non-Episcopal churches. And we came together and we provided volunteers and lunches on Saturdays for a habitat build. We would pick one site and we would stick with that for the build season, which was generally the summer. And St. Andrews was a part of that and Christ Church was a part of that. Both still are. And so I, part of my time, if you will, my diaconal time is coordinating that effort. There's a lot of help. I have a friend, Christina, who helps with communication and so forth. So we're, there's a lot of us out there pulling together. And as folks have aged, we're now mostly doing lunches on Saturdays during the build season. So my efforts are like being somewhere liturgically on Sunday, but then expanding that and trying to connect the congregations to the ministry in the world that the bishop had encouraged us to do. Well, that sounds uh, very true to our vows as deacons. <laughs> That's yeah. right there. And can you tell us a little bit more about the lunches that you provide for the Habitat? I, found, I find that really interesting. Well, you know, pre-pandemic, we had people making lunches. We had a every congregation that was part of the coalition would have a crew of volunteers, individuals or volunteers who would make lunches for the workers. And pre-pandemic, they were making 20 lunches a Saturday and they folks from the church would deliver the lunches and it provides an opportunity for the volunteers to eat well and uh, not have to leave the site. So it, it keeps the work day more efficient. And so we provided lunches for up to 20 people prior to the pandemic. After the pandemic, rules have changed and so forth, but we have congregations providing 10 to 12 lunches a day, a Saturday, and they're on a rotation. So of the five churches, each church takes a Saturday and they give two or three times during the summer months. It depends on how long the build is. So this is a way for people to be involved in habitat, but not have to be building and there all day. Well, I, I'm one of the few people who still goes and builds. Yes, of, of that crowd. I'm one of the few that still goes and builds. We do have a few, but as the congregations are aging, and I think the heat makes it hard, you know, this global warming situation we're in makes it hard for folks of a certain age to feel comfortable working in, you know, 85 degree, 90 degree weather, hammering and sweating like a crazy person is, it's not necessarily the wisest decision for people of a certain age. So, but they can make lunch and, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and they can deliver lunches and they do. That's great. That's great. There's something, 
something for everyone, you know, yeah. to wherever your skills and energy lies. So, Anne, one of the other things that you're doing, which really interests me, is the, let's see, I want to get the name of it right, the Siemens Church mm -hmm. Institute. And I'm thinking, now, my geography is pretty bad. Since you're in Cincinnati, that's on the Ohio River, I think. Good. That's good, that, John. Is, what, what, where are these seamen? Where do they come from? And what are you doing uh, with that institute? Well, you know, I knew about the Siemens Church Institute from living in Baltimore. And Baltimore has the Chesapeake Bay, of course, and blue water which is what the oceans and the large bodies of water are called, blue water, are referred to. And oh, Cincinnati has brown water. We have the Ohio River, and I'm looking at it right now out my window, and mm. it doesn't look brown. It looks a little grayish green, but it looks healthy. So that's good. The Mississippi River tributaries on, and inland waterways uh, that are navigable are, in fact, some of the largest commercial transportation pathways in our country. I watch towboats and barges go up and down the river every day. I have a little log that I keep just as my little hobby. When I see a, a towboat go by, I write it down. I write down what time it goes by and um, the name of the towboat and what the cargo is. And so I see coal and gravel and petroleum and asphalt go by my balcony uh pretty much every day so yeah so so we are a commercial roadway if you will the folks that work that waterway are underrepresented they are unknown they're hidden as a culture and as a workforce it's unknown to probably 80 percent of the population in the united states so siemens church institute has a has an office in paducah kentucky which is very close to where the Ohio River joins the Mississippi. They have a training center there to help train their boat staff, their captains and pilots and deckhands and so forth in this training center every year. And so my job as a chaplain associate is to be available. I'm a volunteer. Port of <laughs> The port of Cincinnati is a misnomer because there isn't really a port per se. There's not like a central location, but there are five companies that staff towboats up and down the Ohio River that are within the Cincinnati area. And so one of the main ways I connect with them is through our Christmas on the River or Christmas at Sea program that we do every year. So... But if there's a crisis, I can get a phone call, and I have gotten phone calls from the chaplain, the paid chaplain in Paducah, because I can get there. Paducah's five hours from here. Oh. So if there's an incident where a, a towboat is going to be closer to me, they'll call me and ask me to respond. What inspired you to get involved in this? I mean, you were doing so much with the congregations, and I'm, I also want to hear about the foot care volunteer, but what inspired you to get involved in the Siemens Church Institute? I've always had an affinity for water, even though I'm not a good swimmer. I love to be on it, not in it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an on-the-water girl, not an in-the-water girl. And I love, I love being on the water. And water is just so life-giving for me. My dad... At one time, after while well, I was in college, actually, my father got a boat, and I lived near the Delaware River. So I've always lived sort of near water. And I just feel like, I don't know, I, it's hard to explain because it's just like, it's a gut feeling more than anything else. It's just, I need to do this. I want to do this. I want to be part of that community. I've never worked in that industry but I have so much respect for the people who do. And, I, and I'm a support person. And I felt like this was a way that I could support and encourage people who work in that industry. What has surprised you about the Siemens uh, Institute or any of the work that you've been doing? What, what, what has brought you the greatest joy? Well, Mark Nesselhut, who's the president developed a relationship with this 
SUNY Maritime College, which is State University of New York Maritime College in Fort Schuyler, New York, which is just on the east side of New York City. And so in this relationship, the school asked Siemens Church to provide chaplains for their summer cruise, which is a requirement of all of the cadets at some time during their schooling, they have to do this eight week summer cruise. And they asked the Siemens Church if they would provide chaplains. So I had the privilege last year of being a chaplain on their summer cruise for two weeks. And so although the cruise itself went from New York to Philadelphia, to Spain, and then to Belfast, Ireland, and then back again, in the first two weeks, which was sort of the shakedown cruise, I basically did donuts in the Atlantic Ocean, which was just fun. And I went from New York to Philadelphia in two weeks, if you can imagine. Wow. Um, you can walk it faster. So. So my surprise, and I think my delight really, was discovering how much I loved that chaplaincy work. I had never really thought of myself in those terms as a chaplain before. Um, and so being able to do that was a real life-giving experience for me. And I would do it again in a heartbeat. Wow. So, and you and Lauren and I all were ordained after many years, it feels like, of, of preparation. <laughs> it was, well, it was. It was like we took, we're slightly over 34 years now yes, of we are. ordained life. But, you know, whenever I think of you, uh, I think back to those days when we were in, in deacon formation. And one of my deepest and strongest memories is your love of music, and particularly when you would uh, lead us or even do solo chanting of uh, so much of the Tze music. And it just warms my heart to even recall that right now. I can hear your voice so clearly. So music, I know you're in the Sweet Adelaide's now, but what, it's a little different than Tze. But music obviously has meant something to you and is part of your connection with the spirit. Could you just talk about that a little bit? Sure, thanks, John. And thank you for that memory, those memories. I, I pray through hymnody. It's interesting because I feel like when I'm singing a hymn, I'm saying a prayer. I've had the privilege of singing the Exaltet um, at the Easter Vigil for almost 40 years because I did it before I was a deacon when we had a very small uh, Easter Vigil at uh, St. Mark's on the Hill in Pikesville. Um, where there were probably five of us that showed up and I got to sing the Exaltet. Um, so, but, but somebody said to me uh, after they heard me sing it for the first time that they sort of, with a slight surprise in her voice, you really prayed that. That was really a prayer. And, you know, my response was, yeah. <laughs> And that's a surprise, you know, because I don't know how, it's kind of part of the fabric of my being. I don't know how to do it any other way. And in truth, it's been a little bit of a struggle for me in singing Sweet Adelines. I got into Sweet Adelines because everything was churchy in my life at that 10 years ago. I was doing everything related, was related to church, and I felt like I was going to lose my mind if I didn't do something not church. So I decided to use music as my outlet and joined this Sweet Adelines group. And it has been a struggle for me because so much of what we sing is not necessarily spiritual or religious or anything else. In fact, some of it's a little, you know, could be suggestive of other things. And so I've I've had to find ways to access and reshape the way I look at that music in my head to try and help it be a joyful experience. Because when I'm singing church music, when I'm singing hymns, when I'm singing Bach or Beethoven or any of that, it the joy naturally wells up within me. But when I'm singing secular music, it doesn't. And so I have to try and help that joy find its way out. Um, 
in secular music. It's interesting. And I, thank you for asking me that question. Yeah, th thanks for the response. It sounds That's like great. a lot of fun too, and so uh, tell tell us how has all of you all that you've done and are doing changed or enhanced your spiritual life? I think that the ministries that I've stuck with have been since I left my full time employment in the church. Um, have been the things that have been touchstones for me in my spiritual life. So, for example, Lauren, you asked me about the foot care thing earlier. There's a ministry that existed long before I came here in Cincinnati of, of offering foot care for homeless people. And it's gone through several iterations, and now it's housed at a ministry center that's run by the Franciscan. We offer foot care twice twice a week and so a literal hands-on ministry hmm. and so every time i engage in that ministry i revisit jesus washing the feet of his disciples and i think and i pray with these folks and pray with their feet pray with their hands if they want a prayer i can offer that i'm not proselytizing but i'm listening and if prayer seems appropriate out loud i'll do that but what it does for me is it keeps me grounded in what my faith is about that that really being present to the to folks who don't have the wherewithal to have comfortable shoes or, you know, folks who don't have a place to regularly lay their head. It's, it's biblical really. And it keeps me connected with those Bible stories. And, and in a way that's what the ministry with the Siemens church does that too, because Jesus, you know, he called fishermen <laughs> to be his disciples. So it's all connected with discipleship to me and how, how I can be a better and a more, a more honest disciple of Jesus. That's why I make the choices I make. I have the privilege of being able to do that, of being able to say, I choose this because it makes me more honest as a human being and as a disciple of Jesus. Wow, no, that's that's so beautifully put in. Thank you so much. I, I'm just wondering, with your, there's such a breadth of things that you've been involved in and so on. What if somebody wanted to learn more about any of these organizations or get in touch with you? Is there a way or are there ways that they can do that? Sure. I'm happy to share my email with you. The Siemens Church Institute has a website so okay so what we can do Anne, is we'll put your email address with your permission in our show notes that people okay. can see if they're listening or or watching this as well as the siemens church institute website That'd okay because be i think that there may be some people that are in discernment around the diaconate and listening to you today and how you have kind of found ways to balance your life and all the different rich ministries you've had over the years and continue to have is is something people may say hey i, I need to talk to this person because maybe she can help me decide is deaconate right for me so yeah. thanks we'll, we'll go ahead and make sure we put those uh, put those in the show notes Anne. great that's great thank you before we go though Anne, is there anything else that that you would like to share about the diaconate and, and your diaconal work or any wisdom that you want to leave us with? Well, the wisdom doesn't come from me. It comes from the community. I think it's been such a delight to be with you two, my colleagues and friends for, for so many years. I think that for, I'll say a final word about the diaconate maybe, and that is that it, it is shaped by who we are. And I think as individuals, but also by the communities in which we find ourselves. And I have had the privilege of being in many, many wonderful and unique situations. And, 
And I think that the whole purpose of my journey has been to keep me honest as a Christian. Mm-hmm. And, and, if, and that, if that's what our lives are about, whether we're deacons, priests, bishops, whatever, lay people, I think our lives need to be a reflection of that. Thank you. Yeah, thank, and thanks so much. Thanks for taking the time to be with us today. I certainly have enjoyed reconnecting with you after way too long. Way too uh, long. This, has been, this has been great. And once again, thank you very much. Thank you. John and I also want to thank all who are listening and watching with us today. We can't do this without you. So please take a moment to comment, like, or share on all your social media sites. This will help us spread the good news to even more people. And again, thank you for the gift of your time with us today. Until next time, peace and blessings. Good News is being brought to you by Listening for Clues. You can find us on our website, listeningforclues.com, our YouTube channel, our Vimeo channel, and just about every podcast platform that there is. Hope to see you soon.